Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Ian Tabor, or better known as Mintinet. Thank you again to Grim for having me at your conference for a second time with my presentation titled Value Past Auto, How I Built It and Saved $28,000. First things first, who am I? You could say I'm the ultimate car hacker. Built this kit car 17 years ago now. It's a Tiger Supercat and it only has three ECUs, of which two of them I built myself. It's basically a Ford Focus engine and Ford Sierra running gear. Uh, doesn't weigh a lot, rear wheel drive, great fun to drive. However, the British weather and life gets in the way, so I don't get to drive it as much as I'd like to. Anyway, on to my car hacking credentials. Here are the details of my previous presentations and events related to car hacking. You may know of me due to my bu me building my car in a box PD0, which is most of the electronics from a 2014 Peugeot 208. I built it at the end of 2018 after seeing Grimm's 3PO at DEF CON Car Hacking Village that year. My car in a box thinks it's a fully working vehicle, um, which I previously presented about at GrimCon 1 and how I now run the Car Hacking Village in the UK. I take my car in a box to events across the UK and I have once been to Amsterdam, which was fun getting through customs. Ask me about it sometime. 2020 was meant to be the tour of Europe year where I was going to visit Dublin, Brussels and Stuttgart. However, um, COVID and Brexit got in the way, but with, through the use of technology, virtual car hacking village happened for a few events and I had uh, I managed to present at some other events too, which I may not have done if COVID hadn't have happened. However, I have been invited globally to take my car in a box to numerous locations, including India, Australia, Philippines, Singapore and Brazil. Um, my car in a box is portable, but it's not that portable. On to the car in a case, Pasta. What is Pasta? Pasta was originally released at Black Hat Europe 2018 and was developed by Toyota Info Technology Center. I have actually seen it in person in September 2019, but I didn't get a chance to play with it. Bit of a shame. So Pasta, portable automotive security test bed with adaptability. Pasta is designed and developed with a following philosophy. It is open. It must be based on non-proprietary technologies. Adaptable, users should be able to rewrite the firmware of the ECUs, redesign the architecture and connect their own devices, for example. Safe, there should be no real actuators. It can avoid incidents such as wheels, brakes and windows should be realized via simulator, not using the real things. Finally, it must be portable. The platform is preferred to be small and portable so that users can study, research and hack it anyway. Here is a picture of Pasta. There is a link at the bottom there that gives you the full details of their um, product. I will go into some highlights. Um, if you want any more information, look at that link and um, watch some of the presentations that they have done at various events around the globe. Um, the case in question is probably about the same size as the average gentleman's briefcase, shall we say. Top half of the case is inputs and outputs. There are three screens and a load of buttons. The bottom half of the case, there are four ECUs. Um, three of them are body, chassis and powertrain. The fourth one is the gateway that joins them all together. The gateway ECU has a fourth CAN bus connected to it via the OBD2 port, which on that picture is not shown because it's in the bottom right hand corner. Um, I will go over some highlights of how I believe it fits together, but they will not go over the full details. So Pasta is open source. Within that GitHub repository, there is the firmware for the ECUs, there is the hardware and software spec, there is the um, schematics for the ECU, um, there are some CAN definition files. One thing they do not publish within there is any great detail on how the top half of the case connects to the bottom half. Okay, we can see that there are three screens, uh, powertrain, body and chassis, going to the three ECUs. Um, if you read the document Pasta 1.0 ECU hardware software spec version 1.0e, uh, it says that the IO is connected via serial using SCI0. That can be confirmed by looking at the um, closely at the diagram. The pins on the left here are where the IO SCI0 is, so I would assume that that it connects, but there's no great detail. However, looking at the CAN definition files, all the switches and potentiometers across here um, initiate messages from the chassis ECU. So that is where they will be connected online. So this white box ECU, what is it? There is a picture of it. 
big black chip in the middle there is a Renesis RX63N processor. It has 2 meg flash, 256k RAM. Internally, internally there is a real-time clock, an Ethernet Mac, USB 2.0, 3 times CAN 2.0, I2C, SCI, SPI, and probably some 3 letter acronyms I've missed out. Um, when I first started looking in 2020, this chip was available about $26 each. However, it's no longer available. There is a similar replacement chip. It's $15 each, but there is a minimum order quantity of 480, which sums up to be $7,200 just in processors before you start. So the white box ECU needs four CAN buses. It has three internally. The additional one is provided via an external CAN controller, the microchip MCP2515. Uh, in the middle there, you can see uh, four CAN transceivers. Um, they are the NXP TJA1050s. They can run up to one megabits um, CAN bus. Um, the yellow connector there is RS232. Um, JTAG is there. Battery there for the real-time clock. And on the reverse, I believe, is a micro SD card um, for future possible expansion. So the CAN definition file. Here is a uh, abstract of that CAN definition file within from within that GitHub repository. Um, it shows the source and destination of CAN messages, the frequency of the message being sent, and finally how the data is encoded in the data bytes of that CAN message. So if we look at the top row in the pink-ish, um, we have a break operation indicator. Its source is the chassis ECU. Its execution is the powertrain ECU. It has an ID in decimal of 26. It has an ID in hex of 01A. It is repeated every 10 milliseconds. It's got the length of two data bytes. It's off or minimum is zero. It's on or maximum is 1023, which means it's a 10-bit number. And its unit is percent. So, um, finally, here is a calculation that tells you 256 times A plus B, all divided by 1023, gives you that percentage. Um, on the next slide, I will summarise this entire document rather than you having to read it all. Um, here it shows you that the um, chassis bus is sending 810 messages per second. The powertrain bus is sending 668 messages per second, and the body bus is sending 380 messages per second, not bus, ECU. Um, the total number of messages going into the um, gateway ECU is therefore 1,858. However, it also has to send those 1,858 messages back out again to the other ECUs on the other side. So the CAN gateway ECU is actually processing 3,716 messages per second. So on to the inputs and outputs. As I said previously, there are three um, CP, uh, LCDs that show for the powertrain body and chassis ECU. They show outputs from the ECU itself. Um, and then there's switches underneath. The following, um, there are three potentiometers, um, brake, accelerator, and steering, two rotary encoders, headlight and front washer wiper, three toggle switches, which is shift position, indicator or blinker, rear washer wiper. There are eight push switches, four of which are for the windows up and down, and the final four also have indicators, which is for the ignition, door locks, handbrake, and hazard lights. Uh, finally, at the top of the um, case itself, you will see a small USB Bluetooth um, dongle that is used for the Bluetooth connected car that can be controlled via a pasture itself. Anyway, enough of the Toyota version. We go on to value pasture auto. Software is written within the Arduino IDE. First thing I had to do was work out if the microcontroller and or the library in use would be able to send enough messages quick enough. The MCP2515 library it's, I was using, still am using, is one from Corey J. Fowler, um, link being there. What I did was wrote a script for my nano CAN device to send as many CAN messages as it could for five seconds, and then take an average number of the count that was um, created from those five seconds and analyze that using a logic analyzer. 
A single 8-byte CAN message will take about 240 microseconds on the wire um, at 500 kilobits per second CAN bus, which gives a theoretical maximum for that bus speed of just over 4,000 messages per second. Here is the first bit of analysis on the 2016 library. Um, managed to get through about 848 messages per second. Um, looking at the way the library works and the data sheet, um, the first command here is read a register to check if the buffer is empty. I then write um, the eight bytes of data into the, um, into the controller. I then write another um, byte in from the data length. I then write four bytes in for the header information of the CAN message. I then finally write a single bit into a um, register that says transmit the message. On the wire, the message then transmits. I then check to see whether that message has been checked, uh, sent, and everything starts again. As you can see, there is a fixed period here between this command and the result, this command, the result, this command, the result. This command the result. Um, this was actually written into the library itself of a 250 microsecond delay, so I think we can do things better. Um, the later version of the library itself, the 2017 version, I could manage to get 2,606 messages per second because of removing those delays. Um, again, we're using the same method of um, check a register, write some data, write some more data, write some more data, send the message. It then does some polling to see whether the message is sent. Finally, when the message is sent, it then allows it to send the next message. Um, this time, the delays have been removed. We we're just waiting for the polling to um, happen. However, looking at the data sheet for the CAN controller itself, there is a function that allows you to write all of the data into our uh, transmit buffer zero in one go. So I modified the library itself to actually do this in one go. Uh, as you can see here, there is the command that sends some data to the CAN controller. There's a single command that says send the data. We then poll it a load of times, find out it's sent, and then reset the bit in the interrupt function to say the message has been sent, and everything starts again. This version of the library managed to send 3,049 messages per second. Um, um, as you can see here, there's a minor delay between the writing of the data in and actually the sending. This is due to the digital write function being used in the Arduino IDE, which takes about 8 to 10 microseconds, which means you can actually make it even quicker. Um, this is the final version of the library that I used in that I used direct port manipulation and managed to get it down to 3,309 messages per second as you can see down the bottom here, write the data in almost immediately, tell it to transmit, and then it transmits. So that's a bit better than the 848 messages per second, and the deck direct port manipulation only takes two microseconds. So onto the microcontroller. The original plan was to try and use an Arduino Mega 2560, which has the Atmega 2560 16 megahertz CPU, but has no can controller on board. Um, this will potentially cause issues because you're forever waiting for the SPI bus to get the data out of the controller or forever polling the controller. Um, so that was sort of parked. Um, I then looked at the It's Bitsy M4 via Adafruit. It has the Atsam V51 at 120 megahertz. Um, Again, it has no CAN controllers, so would have to have four external SPI-based controllers. Um, again, it would be forever waiting to see whether those um, SPI controllers are actually got any data. So finally found the Teensy 4.0, which is an ARM Cortex M7 at 600 megahertz. Can be overclocked to over a gigahertz if you add some heat sinks. Um, the good thing about this um, microcontroller, it has two CAN 2.0. Um, controllers on board and one can FD client controller. Um, looking at the um, benchmark stats for those three different ECUs or microcontrollers, shall we say, um, the Arduino Mega has a value of seven, the Metro M4 has a value of 215, which is about 30 times faster. Um, 
And then the Teensy 4 has a value of 2,314, which means the Teensy is about 300 times faster than the Mega. It's a pretty good little chip in the scheme of things. On to the hardware, the PCBs. Here is the version 0 of my PCB from 2020. Um, there is actually a mistake on it. Here you can probably see it at the bottom there. There is an LED, um, single surface mount one. It should have been a NeoPixel, but I put the footprint on backwards, so we couldn't use it. Um, here we have the Teensy 4 on the left, um, battery connector for the real-time clock, the external CAN controller here, and um, clock. We then have four uh, CAN transceivers, the third one down being slightly different in that it's a CAN FD transceiver. And then we have the automotive grade connectors on either side. The right hand side is CAN and power. The left hand side is inputs and outputs. Um, I did actually create a version 1.1 of the um, PCB to fix the um, NeoPixel footprint, but I never sent it to fabrication. I then created a version 1.2, which um, uses has some extra additional interrupts on the CAN controller to allow you to trigger on transmit or receive buffers directly as opposed to um, using uh, SPI interrupts or SPI control. Again, it looks almost identical to this. The other one, um, the only one out of the four is actually, uh, is actually 1.2, is the gateway one, because that's the only one that needs to actually use all four of the CAN controllers. Um, here is the I.O. board. Um, the I.O. function is uh, provided via two MCP23017 I.O. expander boards, uh, each of which has 16 inputs or outputs, which you can see at the top there. You've got two rows of eight uh, above the two uh, two chips. At the bottom there you've got some power and ground. You then have the four analog inputs, the next in serial which is um, serial 5 within the um, Teensy. Um, on the powertrain ECU itself um, analog 2 and analog 3 is used for serial 4 uh, and again we have a 20 pin automotive grade connector uh, to connect it back to the ECU itself. It's a different one to the um, ECU and it's keyed slightly differently. It's black rather than grey, so you can't mess it up and get it the wrong way around. Here is what it looks like within the roof. Um, it's a bit messy. Um, I really don't want to unplug it, so that's all you're going to get regarding pictures. So again, onto the inputs and outputs. There are three three and a half inch Nextian human and machine interface screens. Um, I'll go into a bit detail on that. Um, those are individually connected to the three ECU's powertrain body and chassis. We then have all, most of the switches on there are connected to the chassis ECU. There are three potentiometers, again for brake, accelerator, steering. There is a little steering wheel there. It came off of the keyring. There are two rotary encoders, including push for front light um, and flash and front wiper and washer. There are five toggle switches, two for the windows, one for indicator, one for gear indicator, and one for the rear wiper and washer. Um, there are six push switches, you can see hazards, lock and horn, and two additional push switches that include two indicators for parking brake and ignition. In the bottom left hand corner, you can also see another rotor encoder and potentiometer, which is connected to the powertrain ECU, which is used for the mode functions to um, connect the box itself to the um, Bluetooth car, etc. Uh, there is a Bluetooth BTO5 on the powertrain ECU. You can't see it at the moment because it's tucked down the left hand side somewhere. Um, there is a bit of black acrylic underneath it, which holds it all together, which was manually cut in my kitchen. Don't tell the wife. It actually needs to be replaced, but I personally like it because it shows that it was sort of hand built. So on to what it looks like. Here is the case in the closed variety. It's quite small. It's quite portable. It doesn't really weigh a lot. It's a lot lighter than my car in a box. Here is the case open. As you can see at the bottom there, there are the four ECUs. I am actually using PCBs for the front and rear plate so I can get them cut out correctly as opposed to me using 
uh, again a file and a drill on the kitchen um, that tell the missus uh, onto a close-up of the top half again you can see the top half acrylic it is wedged in with a bit of bubble wrap which stops it falling out when you open the lid however we are where we are onto the bottom half of the case so in the bottom half you've got the four ecus across the middle there in the bottom right hand corner you've got a 12 volt to 5 volt power supply the 12 volt also fills the obd2 port to give it power uh, bottom left hand corner there you have a six-way fuse box um, those are actually connected behind together but it allows you to jump into each of the three buses for powertrain chassis or body um, they actually are connected the jumper wires are connected to pins 3 and 11 on the obd2 port um, the standard 6 and 14 is connected to the gateway ecu's obd2 port as well top half is of the case looks like this if you accidentally open it when the um, bubble wrap isn't wedged in um, that bit of card holds it all together behind that bit of card is a bit of a spaghetti mess I'll use some of my other little PCBs that I've broken misconfigured etc as sort of holders to hold it all together it works quite well um, the case in question is 255 by 345 by 115 millimeters um, for you in inches, it's about 10 by 14 by 5, I think. So the code, as I said previously, I started on the repetitive sending of the dummy data um, using timer-based interrupts to make sure I could send that 810 messages per second. Once the IO PCBs arrived, I had to then write the code to interact with the inputs and the next in displays. Um, initially, there were four separate bits of code, each for the four ECUs. However, I have subsequently aggregated them into a single code sketch within my github repository there are the original single ecu codes but i offer no warranty on them at all i have no warranty on the, the whole solution either so the next gm human machine interfaces they are serial based displays uh, which send serial commands back and forward you basically program it with some something to display on this ide um, you can then make things visible or not visible. You can make values show up, etc. Make dials change um, by sending data. You can also run a simulator to show what would happen on one of their boards. Um, in the left hand side there, it says page zero. That basically tells it to turn to page zero. In the middle, you can see the result of that command, which goes back to the microcontroller or the simulator. Those um, character bytes there basically tell it it is now at page zero so the microcontroller knows who those things are next screen is a little demo um, start on page one i think it is and then paste something in that says go to page zero which does my little intro screen flashes for all the lights etc opens and closes the windows and then sends a um, thing saying the page is done it then puts the brake lights on I then paste in again, turn off the brake lights, um, and then click around the screen to show you there are hot areas on the screen for the doors, bonnet, and trunk. Um, that allows you to send data back to the ECU saying someone's clicked on something um, so that it can do something with that. It works quite well. They are pretty cheap. I'll go into costs in a minute. Next part of the solution is the little Arduino based car. I bought this from Amazon for about £50, I think it is. Um, by default, it can be used using Bluetooth, infrared, ultrasonic detection or line following. I had to modify the code that controls the lights to be the same as the body ECU so that um, when the lights come on the body, um, the lights would come on on the car correctly. It's like indicators, side lights, headlights, main beam. I also had to change the gateway code to allow some of those messages to go to the um, powertrain ECU because normally the powertrain ECU wouldn't see the details of the horn, etc. There is some logic within the powertrain ECU that tells um, the car how fast to drive or how fast not to drive. It basically calculates a value um, depending on the accelerator pedal, the brake pedal and the handbrake status and the engine on status and then sends it over bluetooth to the car 
So onto a bit of a demo. So here's a demo. First turn it on, go through its initialization sequence. You can see the little red flashing light in the corner that shows the Bluetooth is working. Um, first turn the um, ignition on by pressing the ignition on button, which works fine. Then take the handbrake off on the left. Um, there is an issue here with switch bounce, but um, it does work most of the time. So the handbrake is off. I then turn it around to mode B, which means the Bluetooth car is connected. I can then increase and decrease the accelerator. You can see the accelerator going up and down on the rev counter. Brake you can see changing. The indicator is flashing on both the chassis and body ECU, both for right and left. We then change the gear from park, reverse, neutral, drive. And now um, what I am doing is going to uh, lower the um, right hand window, lower the left hand window. Try and lock the left hand door, lock the right hand door. Again, we're having switch bounce issues. Doesn't really matter most of the time. That's that. Uh, now we go on to a demo of some hacking happening. What I have connected to the um, OBD2 port um, and also the chassis ECU is a NanoCAN device which is um, spoofing hazards on flashlight, flash the headlights, fuel gauge at 40%, coolant temperature max, steering at full right, and accelerator at 10%. If you watch both the chassis and body ECU, you can see things happen. Those messages get injected. So here we go. Uh, lights are flashing, indicators are on. Um, fuel and temperature gauge is going nuts and the accelerator is going nuts. Uh, as you can see, it's stuck on with the hazards and the lights. You basically have to interact with the inputs, otherwise it will not reset it because it looks for a change of the inputs normally. Um, that's that demo done. Um, here's another little demo with my little friend Biggie, uh, the mascot of the car hacking village. Hello! Um, he's now going to be driving on a full left-hand steering and the same messages are going to be injected again, full right-hand lock, um, change of accelerator speed, flashlight, etc. So we're going around full left. I'm going to inject the full right hand lock, which is causing it to stutter. Again, stuttering again. Uh, he's getting a bit dizzy. Uh, the hacking has stopped. Now I'm going to turn around. And then lights on. And whee! Disappear into the sunset. So, finally, how much did it cost me? So, Costs here shown are from mid 2020 and do not include postage and packing. Um, the ECU boards themselves, um, creating my own custom PCBs, getting all the different parts. The Teensy itself is about £20. Um, they cost about £50 each in total, and there is four of them, so that's £200. The IO boards cost about £25 each. There are two of them for the um, chassis and powertrain. The Body ECU doesn't require a IO board, so it didn't need one connecting, it just needed the um, next in display connecting. So that's a total of £50. Uh, the three, three and a half inch next in displays are about £30 each. They are pretty good. They go all the way up to, I believe, 10, 12 inches in size um, with quite a lot more resolution. So that's a total of £90. Um, the case, the car, the cabling, the switches, and all of the bits on the inside uh, come to about a total of £160. So in total, it costs me £500 to build, which at about today's exchange rate, that's $800. Um, Toyota Pasta Auto, um, currently, if you want to purchase it, is $26,780. Um, so I built it and saved $25,980. So maybe I should have changed the name of my presentation to Value Pasta Auto, how I built it and saved $25,980.
Finally, I'd like to say thank you for, to my missus for putting up with my crap. And while I've been building this and PDO, I'd like to say thank you to Terry Ip. Um, he used his um, 3D printer to print the um, surrounds for the next gen displays to allow me to put them into the case. I'd also like to say thank you for the Grim Cyber team for allowing me to be here and for their previous help with my um, car in a box. I have actually sent um, Bitbane um, a couple of the different PCBs if he wants to try and build one of the ECUs himself, but I don't think he has. But again, thank you. I will be around for the next 15, 20 minutes on Discord. If you have any questions, if you want any more information, contact me via the methods up the bottom there. And there is a link to my GitHub for all the files relating to value pass to auto. Thank you very much and good night.